We're going to open up with a quick exercise real quick. So take your hands and go like this. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, uh, uh. We are in the book of Psalms. And as we mentioned, the book of Psalms is not like any other book of the entire Bible. Yeah. When we look at Genesis, Exodus, Revelation, these are books of the Bible that give us doctrine, reproof, instruction. But when we look at them, they're God's words to us. When we look at the book of Psalms, it's man's words to God. So when we are feeling down, why do we turn to the book of Psalms? Because it's something we can relate to. We may not have the words to say, but they convey how we are feeling towards God. God, this is what I'm going through. God, this is what I feel on the inside. This is my desire. We've just concluded with the songs of ascent. We'll do a few more. And then we will start our new series on the church and study on what is the church. But today we are going to be looking at Psalm chapter 137. Psalm 137. And would someone like to go ahead and read verse 3 for us? There at the header, it's on the top of the page if you don't have any Bible. Except the third verse. Yep, third verse. Psalm 137, verse 3. For they, for they're the, they that carry us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So we are looking at Psalm 137. As we begin our study, we would see that there are nine verses. It's been said, or written anyhow, by Christopher B. Hayes in his um, writing, how shall we sing Psalm 137 in historical, canonical context? He wrote an article. And in it, he said, logistically, this psalm possesses ties between Obadiah and Jeremiah, chapter 49 and verse 7, all the way through 22.9. I don't understand where he was coming with the 22.9, but we can see by looking at this, there are ties between language-wise between Obadiah and Jeremiah. Now I'm going to go ahead and read the, um, Psalm 137 and we'll continue our discussion as usual. What is the key verse? What is the key word? Or words and phrases. So 137 reads this. By the rivers of Babylon there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and that they wasted us, oh, required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If we forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes thy little ones against the stones. So as we're looking at Psalm 137, what do you think would be the key verse or verses of this chapter. Key verse or verses being the, that verse or verses that summarize this chapter in a nutshell. We have a little bit more to work with than we have in the last couple weeks. The last couple weeks we've only had three verses. This one we have none. But what would be that verse or verses that would summarize Psalm 137? By the rivers of Bayon. But what verse are you on, sister? Uh, the first verse of Psalm um, 137. Yeah, we could go with by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, yea, we wept, we remembered 
Zion. Because when we're looking at this whole chapter, it's all about the captivity of Jerusalem. Or we could say the captivity of the Israelites. And when we say Israel, we're talking Israel and Judah because this is the time of the divided kingdom. But they are in Babylon and they're in captivity. And they're saying, how can we... And we wept because they remember Zion. What is Zion? They remember where they came from. They remember their temple. Zion is that holy hill of God, which we talked about where his throne resides in heaven. But it's also a physical location where Jerusalem and the temple was. That was the nucleus of their lifestyle. That's where the temple was. That's where the social laws came from. Anybody else have anything else that they might think might be a key verse? Expecting them to be able to sing in a time like that, you know, like when they're going through, but you know, it's, that'd be like hard for people to do, you know, like. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's not just any songs, but the songs of Zion. Yeah. You know, it's almost, and we'll talk about this, but in a way, it's almost like they're mocking them. You know, sing us some of the songs of your God. We saw how well He protected you. Why don't you sing us some of the songs that you worship? For myself, I just went with verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord song in a strange land? Because there you have Babylon and the singing all in one verse. Because that's exactly what's going on here. The Israelites are in captivity. They're in Babylon. Next to their time in Egypt, we're talking about the most severe time that they've been in captivity. Because in a sense, their captivity... While they have a freedom, it's not really ended, ended. Because we just see them starting to go back to their homeland. They, well, I should say it ended probably about 1948, but to a degree, taking, and I know I'm being confusing. When we look at Babylon, that's really when the times of the Gentiles came into play, as we call them. And what that is, is that's the time when the Babel, when the Israelites were dispersed throughout the entire known world at the time. That's why some went to Egypt, some were in Egypt in captivity, some were in Babylon, and we know some went to Persia, and even when we look at the world today, where are the Israelites? They're scattered all abroad. They're not in one central spot. We do see the prophecy of Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones coming to play, and that prophecy is all about the Israelites themselves, the Hebrews, returning to their homeland. And we do see that more and more at this point in time. But they are in a strange land here. And they are required to sing the songs of Zion. Does anybody else have any other verses that think might be the key verse or verses? Or shall we move on? How about we move on to key phrases? We went with the large, and now we're slowly working our way down. And the reason for that being is it's easy to describe something in a lot of words. But the more concise you have to get, the more time and thought it takes. And they say the same thing about preaching. Anybody can get up and speak for a long period of time, but get that train of thought down to five minutes or ten minutes takes a whole lot more work because you need to be conscious of what you're saying. So that's what we've been through doing throughout all the weeks. We've been starting large with the key verse and working our way down to the small. So what would be a key phrase or phrases to summarize Psalm 137? <coughs> Happy shall you be. Happy shall you be? Anybody else want to add to it? Remember what this song is all about. For myself, I chose singing the Lord's song because we're talking about the captivity and them singing the song of Zion. Does anybody else have anything? What would be a key phrase or phrases to summarize? Psalm 137 in a nutshell. Uh, not forgetting Jerusalem. 
not forgetting Jerusalem because that's a big part at the end because they go into such great length to, if we forget Jerusalem, may our tongue cleave to the roof of our mouth. Basically, I, may I be in despair. May my body fall apart to some degree. I also threw in there, carried us away because we're talking about the captivity, Babylonian captivity and them singing the songs of Zion. And uh, remember, O Lord. Remember, O Lord. If nothing else, let's scale it down even farther. What would be a key word or words? And when I say words, I mean individual words that would describe Psalm 137. Happy. Happy? going on in this passage is all it is. So when we look at the main thought, they're in captivity and they're trying to be forced, their captors are trying to force them to sing the song of Zion. So Babylon, and Zion. Zion, Jerusalem, sing, and I threw in there forget as well, lest we forget Jerusalem. So let's move on a little bit farther, start talking about the psalm in a little bit more detail. One thing I love to do, and I know I say it every week, and it's probably repetitious at this point, and redundant, but there's nothing like, I'm a digger. When it comes to Bible study, I'm a digger. If I find something, I like to pull it apart and pull it apart and pull it apart. And I will exhaust it if you let me. So I try. that's why Sunday school takes a little bit longer sometimes when we do series. Because I like to pull it apart. Give me meat. Give me something I can chew on. So when we look at this passage in general, I wanted to look at it and say, is there anything in Psalm 137 that is relayed in the New Testament? Did Jesus quote Psalm 137? Did any of the apostles quote Psalm 137? Did, did the apostle Paul quote 137? And nowhere do I find that Psalm 137 was quoted in the New Testament. There's similar language that is used from Psalm 137 in the um, Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, but as far as a direct quotation or even reference to it, there's nothing. Nothing that I can find. There's no real history behind it. I mean, we can start pulling the history out of it, what we know about it, they're in the Babylonian captivity. We know what's going on here. Israel's been divided. The divided kingdoms, the two tribes, Judah and Israel, they've both been taken over and conquered. They've been sent away to foreign lands. Now, what about Christ in the psalm? Because when we look at the Bible, it's all about one person. And that is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is a reference to Jesus Christ. This is the written Word of God, and Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. But Jesus Christ is portrayed and seen throughout the entire Bible, whether we realize it or not. We can always find Him in every single passage or attributes of Him. And when we look at Psalm 137, Keith L. Brooks stated, The Christian is not tied to Jerusalem in the temple, for he finds acceptance with God, anywhere and always through his son christ is our joy not jerusalem so as the jews longed for jerusalem in 137 and wrote about it jesus is our joy he's the one that we point to he's the one that we look to if we were to divide this psalm it can actually divide be divided into five sections verses one and two would be the introduction verse three would be the opening the core of the psalm is found in verses 4 through 6. Then you have the closing in verse 7. And then it concludes in verses 8 and 9. 
So let's dive into Psalm 137 in a little bit more detail. When we look at verse 1, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. When we look at this verse, it reveals to us the situation of Israel right off the bat. Where are they? Babylon. Babylon. Why are they in Babylon? They are, exactly, brother, they are in exile and because of disobedience. They didn't decide to go on a vacation. They didn't decide to take a cruise down the river, Euphrates River, or any of the man-made rivers. But they're there. They're there. Gotta love the English language. They are there because of disobedience to God. And what was this disobedience to God? Idol worship. Idol worship. And it actually goes a little bit farther because I didn't realize this myself. And I'm going back and forth, but Ezekiel chapter 20, and we're not going to read it because it's quite lengthy, 15 through 39. Ezekiel reveals to us the reason why they were going to go into captivity. And that's because of idol worship, idolatry, whatever you want to call it. But he also mentioned one other thing. Because you polluted my Sabbath. You know, how, and that for us should strike home because we can come to church and say, well, I'm not Catholic, I don't worship Mary, or I don't have any idols, or I make sure that I set time apart for God, I come to church. But do we honor the Sabbath the way we're supposed to? The Bible says, if our ox is in a ditch, you don't take care of it. But do we do things that really are extra on the Sabbath that we shouldn't really be doing? Are we working on the Sabbath when we could avoid it? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? You know, really, it should be a time of introspection for us because are we honoring the Sabbath the way we're supposed to? Is God pleased with the way that I spend my will? We'll put it in our terms, our Sundays, because that is our Sabbath. We can argue that the um, Jehovah, it's not the Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh Day Adventist worship on Saturday, the Jews worship um, Friday evening into Saturday evening, which is right, this is not. God never said worship on this particular day. He said, remember the Sabbath. So whatever your Sabbath is, for us it's Sunday. We worship the first day of the week. When we look in the calendar, because that's what the apostles did. That's what the early church did. So how do we spend our Sundays? What do we do on Sundays? Can we honestly say that God is honored with the way we spend our Sundays? You know, it should strike a little bit more home because really it's not a matter of nitpicking. It's a matter of, I want to be right in God's eyes. I want to make sure that I'm pleasing to God because on Judgment Day, it don't matter what Sister Dot says about me or Brother Eli says about me or how he told God that time I made a walk because he talked back while I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, how does God lose? Because the standard is not man, but it's Jesus Christ. We can go back to the old phrase, what would Jesus do? But the truth of the matter is, is not me nitpicking on how do you spend it or you nitpicking on me, but is God truly pleased with how we do it? Maybe we don't. We have our schedule arranged so we don't have to work on Sundays. Maybe, and I realize that there are not some that do, but are we pleasing to God in every area? Because really, that's what it comes down to this Christian walk. It's not just a matter of getting to heaven, but is God pleased with me? Because the thing is, there's going to be come a day when we stand before God and we receive our reward and those that we think didn't do much for the kingdom of God did more than even those in leadership. We'll be surprised who gets what rewards and who gets what crowns when God is in charge and he's handing out those rewards. There will be a separation to some degree on who has more, who doesn't, who's ruling over others. Maybe you're stuck down on what the um, Indians, I say Indians, but um, India and in India, they went the class systems. You had the untouchables. They were the ones that did the dirty work. We might be surprised to find that we're down there and somebody that we thought should be down doing the dirty work of God is sitting and ruling and reigning over a region that we shall, thought maybe we should have. Because there's coming a day when God rules, when Jesus rules in Jerusalem, <coughs> that we're going to rule and reign with him. And people will be divided up to reign and control. And, but where will we be? And it all comes down to not a matter of a 
thirst for power or a hunger for it, but how have we lived our life in accordance to the Word of God and in light of Jesus Christ? Have we been checking ourselves? But I thought that was something that jumped out at me. How they spent their Sabbaths. It was just, wasn't just idolatry, but it was how they spent their Sabbaths. Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. But as we look at verse 1, we see that they are written by the rivers of Babylon. And then what do they do? Yeah, but before that, if we would take it and sat down. they sat down. How many people that are joyous are sitting down, typically? They might be jumping up, they might be running around the place. But what about the person that just sits down? What is their state, typically? What is their state of mind? They're not too happy. Can we say that maybe they're tired of their situation? And if they're tired of their, their situation, guess what's the big D word that's hanging in the and over their head? Impressed. Impressed. They're in despair. They've given up. And they've sat down by the rivers of Babylon. When you look at a river, a river's meant for nourishment, sustenance. In the day and age we're living in, rivers bring enjoyment. You can go out boating, fishing, kayaking, whatever it will be. The river is right there. But are they having a great old time? Are they communing with one another? When it gets to the Hebrew uh, culture, we know that when they're upset, at least in biblical times, they would throw up dirt and put ash on their head and sackcloth and ashes, and they would just sit there. When we look at the book of Job, Job sat there, if I'm not mistaken, for about a week with his friends, just talking to him. And it was about a week before Job answered. He just sat there in discouragement, despair. When we look at verse 1, in the very beginning, we see a situation of doom and gloom, of despair. They've given up. They are by a river, something that brings light. But yet, they feel death within themselves. They are down. They are out. And they just sit down. The person who sits down is more times than not the person that's just given up. A person that has hope, he gets up, he'll try something else. He might get knocked down a little bit, but then he gets right back up, and he tries it again, or he does something different. Not these people. They are by the river, and they just sit down. That is all there is to it, and that is all she wrote. And as we continue on, they didn't just sat down, but we see more proof that they're in a state of despair. And then they wept. They don't know what else to do. They are in a strange land. There appears to be no hope. While well, the life giver giving waters are right next to them, something that gives life to plants, animals, humans, they're right next to the source, but they've just given up. And there's more to the rivers, and if we get time, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But they sat down, and they wept. And why did they weep? Because they probably realized what they've done. They are there because of their own fault. Well, maybe not just that, but what does the scripture tell us? Why did they weep? The end of verse 1. Because they remember Zion. They remember Zion. And what's in Zion? The temple. The temple. And how do they remember their temple? If we go back from history and the Word of God, do you know what the temple looks like at this point in time? Is it? Probably in ruins now. It's in ruins. In fact, when we go into investigating on Where's the Ark of the Covenant today? They go back to an old mosaic. It's not even a mosaic, but an old carving of the Babylonians coming in and carrying off the temple goods. And we know that the Babylonians carried off the temple goods because we read of that in Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar brings out the cups and golden vessels from the temple. So when they look back and they remember Zion, the city is in ruins. 
whether or not they realize that there's a puppet government set up in Jerusalem that the Babylonians are controlling, and their temple's been destroyed. The menorah, the golden candlesticks, they've been carried off, and who knows where they're at? The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, where is it? Because today we don't know where it is. And we all trace it back to the disappearance being right to the time of the Babylonians. Where is the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God? And they weep because they remember their temple that was once grand and luxurious. Because we all know that there's never been a temple more grand and splendor than the Temple of Solomon. I mean, they built other temples afterwards, but the men who remember the temple here that we are talking about when Nehemiah and Ezra, when they're rebuilding the temple, I can't remember what book it is, but the Bible says that the young men rejoiced because they were rebuilding the temple. And what did the old men do? They wept because they remembered the old temple. This is nothing like what it used to be. It's not near the splendor of what it used to be. When sin creeps in, you'll never be what you used to be. The splendor that you had, your relationship with God, is no longer what it used to be. So we as Christians need to be careful in our everyday life that we are treating the things of God as pure and holy. That we're reverencing Him. God, if there's any sin in my life, take care of it. Because if not, we're going to find ourselves in the same situation as these people possibly. Because sin doesn't just come in for a little bit. But you give it a little bit of a foothold and it creeps in more and more and more. Until you find yourself just sitting down and saying, God, I don't know what else to do. And we're weeping by the river of, of Babylon. And the Bible says they're not just weeping by the rivers of Babylon. And they're just sitting down. But in verse 2, they hung their hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. When we're looking at Psalm 137, it's all about the Babylonian captivity and the Babylonians wanting the Israelites to sing the songs of Zion, but they're in despair. How can we? Zion is no longer what it used to be, brother Eli. It is destroyed. It is in ruins. It is in rubble. Well, that's, they're not happy in this chapter at all, brother, trust me. They're not happy one iota. But when we look at the Jews, they're a very emotional people. And they like to sing. We know that from the book of Psalms. We know that from the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms that they sung as they carried themselves to the temple. But they hung up their instruments upon the willow tree. And when we look at the willow trees themselves, are the willow trees something that is a sign of, of hope? And no. no. When we look at the willows, the willow tree itself gives us that self of a sense of sadness, of sorrow. Well, when we look at all the other trees and bushes, what their branches outreach, the willows are hanging down to the ground. Sadness. So we have another picture of just what their situation is. It's despair. It's doom. It's gloom. They remember Zion, but Zion is no more. How can we sing our psalms of Zion in a strange land? Our gods, in a sense, in the eyes of the Babylonians, their god, Jehovah, was dethroned. The Ark of the Covenant was taken. His house was destroyed. There is nothing left. And we just get the sense of utmost sadness and despair for the Israelites. And then it goes on in verse 3, For they carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they that wasted us, required of us mercy, sing unto us the songs of Zion. When we get to verse 3, we see the Babylonians just mocking the Israelites to some degree. You know, where is your God now? Why don't you sing us some of their songs? And don't you do it with that sadness and that ash. You wipe that off your face. You need to do it with gladness and happiness. Sing the songs of your Lord and do it with joy. If that isn't ever a slap in the face. But you know, if we're not careful, the devil will do the exact same thing to us. If we're not living right, if we're not doing what we're supposed to, you remember your God. 
You remember how good God was to you. But where are you now with him? Can he hear you? Because if you're living in sin, there's only one prayer that God is required to hear and answer, and that is the song of the sound of repentance. And even through that whole time, maybe while we're trying to get back to God, the devil will be in your well, why don't you praise God? You know what you've been doing. You messed up again. But the Israelites here, they're in captivity, and their captives are forcing them to sing the songs of their Lord. And to do it with happiness. And I'm so far off my nose, it's not even funny. So we'll continue on. But then they get to the point where, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You know, how can we worship God? How can we do that? We're not near Jerusalem. We're not near the temple. And perhaps for them, they weren't even allowed to face Jerusalem and pray to the house of where their God was. But rather, their captors mocked them, saying, where is your God? Why don't you sing his songs? You know, we've taken his house down. We've destroyed it. We've taken his throne and stored it away. All of your God's treasures, the cups, the vessels, the golden candlesticks, they're all over here with our God's house. Where is your God? And they force the Israelites to sing the song of Zion, but yet they weep. And how can we do such a thing? How can we worship God in a strange land? And then we get down to the point where they focus more on remembering what was, what was once. If I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Their one hope, the only thing that was on their mind was to get back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the focus before the captivity. And they're saying, I don't know how long I'll be here, but I can never forget my homeland. I can never forget that this is not my home. You realize that to some degree, we are in Babylon right now. Not because of something we did, but because Adam forfeited the earth over to Satan. And when he did that, sin sickness, disease, they all want to enter into the world. But as Christians, how many of us realize that this is not our home? We're just passing through. May we not forget where our true citizenship lies, and that is in heaven. There is a force for our city. There is a place being prepared for us. May, if I get so caught up in this world that this is my only eyes focus then may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. May I not get so situated and comfortable in this world that I forget where I'm going. So the Jews, they did not want to forget their homeland because Babylon wasn't their home. They were taken captive against their will and they were forced into that location. But they said, my one true desire needs to be to get back home. That is where my hope lies. That is where my joy lies. Not in this land. May I not get comfortable in this land. May I never forget that Jerusalem is my true home. That is where my citizenship lies. And we come down to verse 8. Actually, verse 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. If we were to put it into our modern language, the children of Edom, uh, Edom basically said, burn it, burn it, destroy it, tear it to the ground. Lord, may I not forget Jerusalem, but Lord, don't forget those that have done us wrong. Don't forget those that have worked against your holy people. Don't forget those that have betrayed your holy city. Don't forget those that are partially responsible for your temple to be being left in ruins. And then we get to Babylon, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou that servest us. 
is not happy shall Jerusalem be or happy shall the Israelites be, but happy is the person or the country that destroys Babylon for the sake of Israel. Babylon might have taken Israel into captivity, but there is coming a day when Babylon shall be destroyed. And may the destroyer of Babylon be happy. Happy shall he that taketh and dasheth the little ones against the stone. Basically, happy is he that uttermost that destroyeth Israel, uh, not Israel, but destroyeth Babylon to the uttermost. In the day and age we're living, is Babylon destroyed? Babylon is not destroyed. As we study in time events, Babylon was never really destroyed. In fact, part of Babylon was incorporated into the medieval Persian Empire. And when the Medes and the Persians were conquered, portions of the Medes and the Persians, along with portions of the Babylonians, were adopted by the Greeks. And the Greeks, when they were conquered by the Romans, were not completely destroyed. But part of their kingdom, along with the Medes and the Persians, and the Babylonians, and the Greeks, were all incorporated into the Roman Empire. How do we know that? Because of Revelation chapter 13. It reveals the different parts of the beast as described in the visions of Daniel. Babylon is not completely destroyed. In fact, we know by reading Revelation chapter 17 and 18 that there is coming a day, and on that day shall be uttermost, destroyed to the uttermost. And who is the individual that will destroy Babylon to the uttermost? He is the Alpha, and He is the Omega. He is the beginning, and He is the end. There, towards the end, there will be a destruction and a collapse of the economic pulse system of the world. There will be a destruction of the religious system of the world. And when I say that, I mean the one world religion, the one world money system that we see slowly being placed. We see this. We also see the one world religion slowly being placed too as they cry out for tolerance and for one and unity amongst all religions. But there will be a day when Babylon will be completely destroyed. And on that day, on that day the Jews can rejoice that they have received justification. But what about us as Christians? Where are we? Because if we're not careful, the devil is out to destroy us. And he will use the things of this world to get us. May we never forget, this is not our home. And may we keep looking up. And may we not falter, may we not fail, that when the enemy comes in and tries to make us sit by the rivers of Babylon, May we lift our heads up high, saying that, devil, you are defeated. We are not going to sit down, but we're going to keep pressing on. And one last side note about the rivers of Babylon. The rivers of Babylon were used for entertainment for the Babylonians as well. When they would have their feasts, when they would have their celebrations, they would go down basically on giant party ships with their drums and music playing and celebrating. And the Jews are there sitting on the banks. And maybe they're wanting the Jews to off in the distance sing the song of Zion as they worship their gods. And the Jews say, how can we? We're in a strange land. There is no hope. And while they might be forced to do it, and forced to do it with joy, inside they just feel doom and gloom. For the Christian, there's, we may be in this world, but we are not of this world. We may have to experience some of the doom and the gloom. We experience sickness. We experience sadness. We experience disease. We have to experience the death of loved ones, friends, due to the curse that was brought in this world because of sin. But regardless of what we have to face, we do not have to sit down by the rivers of Babylon. No matter what celebrations are going on on the river, we may be in a strange land, but we can sing the song of Zion. And the reason we can sing is because this is not our home. 
We might be captive in a mortal body, but this is not forever. As long as we keep living right, we can sing the song of Zion because the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Because we know that we've been living right. And because we've been living right, we can worship right. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns from high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would constantly be checking our hearts, Lord. That we may be living right in your eyes. That we may not be doing anything that would displease you. That we would be honoring your Sabbath and your law, Lord. For, Lord, we know that our hearts are deceitfully wicked, and who can know it, Lord? But may we have a desire, Lord, to be more like you than ever before, Lord. May we have a hunger to be constantly in your presence to be changed, Lord. And may our ears be constantly open, open listening to your voice, Lord, that when you say that there's an aspect that we need to change, that we are willing to do it that we may find favor in your sight. Lord, I pray right now that you just anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the song should have us to sing. Give them a special blessing, Lord, as well. Anoint this um, pastor as he brings forth your word today. Anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your words. And anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your message, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be transformed into your very image even farther. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.